Yeah. Yes. I guess my question is to Stephen. Um, one of Hitch Christian Hitchens' quotes uh, was that all religious belief is sinister and evil time. Um, given the basis of your suggested curriculum of Christianity as the base of that, would there be any space for something, some work of Hitchens or a lie? And if not, doesn't that merely make your curriculum as reactionary as modern curriculum? No, thanks for the question. Um, and it's a good, it's a good question. I think that, um, that, that we do take a moderately libertarian approach in the way we treat Christianity and classical Christian education. So we study all the pagan writers of the past and the secular writers of the present. And it's, uh, very much, uh, it's very important that uh, our students are able to uh, dialogue and engage with people like Christopher Hitchens, absolutely essential. Uh, treating other points of view with respect uh, is one of the great features of, uh, of classical Christian education. Coming back to that idea of persuasion, which really enabled Christianity to take off in the Hellenistic world because the Greeks had that concept there already. So it was a very uh, good fit in a way because you could, Paul could go to the Areopagus in Athens and talk about Christianity and was some people laughed at him and said, you're, you know, you're an idiot. Uh, other people followed him and that was, uh, that was there really from the beginning. So I think uh, having the people like Hitchens, I often find Hitchens more entertaining than a lot of uh, conservative Christian commentators, to be honest. <laughs> I have a, a, a comment and I would be interested in your reaction to the comment because uh, my comment could hide a, a, a misunderstanding uh, or an ignorance that I'm carrying around with you. But you, uh, Michelle, you started your, your presentation by very carefully, almost diplomatically saying that occasionally, sometimes, free speech limitations come from Parliament. They all come from Parliament. <laughs> uh, and at least I thought in the, in the Western, uh, this is true. In the Western yes. liberal tradition, yeah. everything is allowed unless it's specifically prohibited. And the only prohibitor that I know is parliamentary legislation, as long as we have the rule of law uh, going on. So my comment will be, all speech limitations, good or bad, that we subscribe to or not subscribe to, but they all come from Parliament. Which is indirectly one, one of my points was that, that perhaps they should, you know, that, that perhaps um, Parliament should be, you know, more mindful of, you know, things like free speech when they're actually legislating, so that they're not legislating in order to restrict speech. I, I don't know whether it came through clearly. Well, it wouldn't have come through clearly in my presentation, but I feel enormously uncomfortable with the implied freedom of political communication because it, it is judicial activism. Um, and and they, they have arguably, though, reacted in that way because Parliament has fa failed to fulfil that role uh, on occasion as, as a protector of speech. Well, yeah, not surprisingly, <laughs> <laughs> I would say. Chris, yeah. Michelle, I'll direct this question to you um, first, but I'd be interested in the views of other people on the panel. Um, you, you made a couple of points about defamation law and the necessity, perhaps, to uh, carve out some more media exceptions. Why media? Uh, un under the arguments that Christian's been rightly making, I think, we, we are now all media. There's not a very clear definition between freedom of speech and freedom of the press. As no. I don't think there ever really was, but it's no. a, it, 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 that obvious and easy distinction no longer exists. Why should we be considered if we're going to carve away more exceptions Stop thinking in this binary distinction between the media and what we say in private. Uh, I, I, I think that's a false conceptual distinction, not only because of technology, but, but particularly because of technology. I, I do agree with what you're saying, and, um, and especially in the light of what Lorraine was talking about this morning, it's kind of like, what is the media and the boundaries of yeah. what the media is are kind of shifting and, and, and moving into the private. So, um, yeah, I, I intended to, to use the media as an example of uh, in the political design report, like a possible future threat in terms of parliament, but, but definitely I agree with you. I mean, why not think about um, extending those protections a bit more broadly? I mean, this is one of the issues that you would have, uh, as you say, you, yeah. you would have had to deal with, with shield laws, which is why, uh, in, in my view, shield laws are a very strange thing because they have to carve out what constitutes someone who gets an exception from the law rather than yep. general law applied yep. to all speakers. Yep. 
and, and the, well, the West Australian legislation basically tried to define a mainstream journalist and said the, the exception will apply to you un, under the principle that there's a high value to be um, attached to the free flow of information between s sources, citizens and, and journalists. But I, I think your point's exactly the right one. And, and if you talk about freedom of speech being the, the message and freedom of the press being the medium, uh, I'm not sure I'd go quite as far as to say that they're now indistinguishable, but I think they will be but pretty they're, soon. They're, perhaps. they're conceptually indistinguishable. Yeah. Now. Yeah. I mean, obviously, we've still got the age and we've yeah. got Twitter, but conceptually speaking, they're not doing enough distinct mm. to, to, to hold that up. Mm. And, and so I fear your, your successor is going to have to amend the shield laws. Oh, look, I think that you'll, you'll have to keep going back to these things. But, I mean, say, for instance, in Sweden, there's laws, as I understand it, with respect to religious vilification, if you like, that you can say whatever you like in private, but you can be prosecuted if you make inflammatory statements about another religious group in public. And, and you know, without knowing too much about those laws, it goes back to this issue of, of free speech versus the medium of free press. And yeah, I'm not sure whether or not you can actually, as a legislator, make that distinction between private free speech and public free speech work, because um, it's just whether or not they're conceptually distinct is a very hard thing to try and work through. Sorry, yes. Andrew Bob would comment that he has been and his readers have been mm. restricted because of the moderators, the expensive moderation on his website. And yet, what happens? Uh, you could go to another website from uh, America where you can read exactly the same comments, yeah. and there's no problems. So. Yeah. We've got the problem that this new media field is, yep. is just changing yep. the whole aspect of things. And with the Finkelstein report, where you've only had a bloggers has only had, had a few hundred hits, yep. well, I don't know, what, 15,000 per year, it's not many. So it's changing the whole field. And when you, you go to YouTube and you watch the, the people abuse each other, it's terrible language using against each other all the time. So where, where does it all, how do you define it and uh, make it work in Australia? Well, my short answer to that is that the horses are bolted and they're somewhere in Vietnam right now. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, when you look at that, that question that you've got, I mean, the innocence of the Muslims, in my view, having just watched it, um, didn't rise the level of sedition. It wasn't a direct incitement to violence, except the violence was predictable, certainly due to an outrageous overreaction, but it was, it was predictable. And based on that, that predictability principle and, and a harm that we knew was going, going to happen, my reading of the law is that the law, say, for instance, in Ireland, which... Um, is in that grey area between sedition and nastiness, a little bit closer to the nastiness edge, um, it, the law in Ireland com would have compelled YouTube to take it down. The law in America certainly would not have, but I guess it raises the secondary question that even if you thought it was a good idea to regulate to get these carriers to take it down, could you actually affect any any outcome from that? Because if you take it down in Ireland, you can still watch it exactly. based, on, based on its uploading in America. And so, a pastor that threatens to burn a Koran and never actually it, does it, it goes uh, worldwide and it causes the same result. Indeed. So it may be that the ultimate answer is that it's just impossible. Um, sorry, Richard, yes. Yeah, at the risk of disagreeing with a former friend and mm. even greater risk of agreeing with <laughs> <laughs> I must say there's something profoundly <laughs> troubling about the idea that a predictable harm should be responded to by the constriction of the liberty otherwise to speak. One can, of course, think of freedom riders in this country or in the American South in the 60s who faced the inevitability and indeed the result of churches being bombed because people spoke out about lynchings and other violent offences against black citizens of that country, which was, I think, a predictable response to that action that was taken. And yet, I think we would all of us be extremely, and I know moderators feel the same, be extremely reluctant to regard the moral cause of the bombings and the murders that took place as the provocative actions of freedom riders, although one can draw a causal inference and one can see that there is one. Yeah. Um, uh, of course, one can approach this as a practical question about how you limit harm, but gee, there's, a, there's, a, there's something very uncomfortable about approaching the question. From that I, I, don't, I don't disagree with you. I, mean, I, I raise it to be provocative in a sense, 
Um, and, and I think that ultimately your argument and, and Jim's is probably the better argument. But you know, when you do think about it, um, there is no way that Channel 9 here um, or the Australian on its website would have, would have uploaded and played the innocence of the Muslims. They just wouldn't have done it. They self-regulate to a point where, because of the harm principle, they don't do it. Now, YouTube and Google interestingly say they won't, and they lied, and they pretended that it fell inside their charter when it was clearly outside their charter and they played it anyway. And, um, you know, that, that step between the government regulating them and the self-regulation isn't a huge step. It might be a very important step, and it might be one that we just ultimately don't don't take. And I, I tend to, uh, to say you, you don't take it because I find conceptually the difference between the megaphone and the voice um, to be little. Like they seem to collapse in on each other eventually as a theory. And the publication of the satanic verses had exactly the same consequences. Well, of, of course. And I mean, you know, there was a piece of art that travelled the world called Piss Christ. And, you know, um, I, indeed. Um, so, you know, I think I, I raise it because I can say as a legislator, you would, you would have to give, give consideration to this. You might ultimately fall on the, on, the, on the side of it just being impossible or being too detrimental to the fundamental value of free speech. But um, you I, think, I think you have to be careful not to reward this kind of behaviour. I mean, I don't know what, what exactly what's going to happen with those radicals in Sydney that caused all this disturbance. But I think that we shouldn't be tough with these people. I mean, so in a certain sense, if you feel too much of that, that it can affect the sensibilities, we are caving in uh, to this kind of behavior and, and accepting that these people can actually dictate the rules of the game. I think this kind of radical should not be, re this kind of behavior should not be re rewarded. I think there should be punishment, actually, and these people should have to face the, the full force of the law. I'm, I'm, I'm I could just add and, and, and maybe take the side of Christian, yeah, and uh, being fully. I don't have a side. No, 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 no. The concern, take the concern. Yeah. Yeah. But and, and at the same time, fully support what the, what, what you should, have said. But imagine, imagine uh, Augusto here, who is sometimes a very fervent supporter of free speech, and sometimes not, as I'm finding out, but sometimes he is. Were to put up all these Mo uh, Mohammed caricatures on his law school website, okay. Um, and, and, and the movie, uh, this clip, you know, this, all, all of this stuff, and um, you know, just to, to make it known where he stands. Uh, and I, as the dean of the law school, and uh, uh, then in, uh, in the situation that maybe the staff might be threatened, okay, and somebody, you know, maybe there are death threats coming into this law school, you yeah. know, the things that yeah. could happen. Can I then say, oh well, you know, I'm a, a fervent supporter of free speech, um, you know? We'll, we'll all arm ourselves and uh, you know, we'll around the perimeter of the building. Or would I have to go and plead at least with uh, with Augusta and say, could you perhaps, perhaps, you know, <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, you know that that is the, the same type of conflict that you would be in as a legislature when uh, when you when when you do this on a more abstract, on a higher level. But the minute I would order him, say, in in, in the line management situation, I would order him take it down. I would be in a severe infringement situation of his academic freedom. Mm -hmm. That otherwise, you know, I would get my own Kalashnikov, well, I use Heckler, of course, <laughs> but like, uh, uh, out to defend. <laughs> it's that type of conflict that you could be in. I mean, this is a bit extreme. It hasn't happened. He hasn't put it up yet. <laughs> not, not yet, not yet. <laughs> Sorry, I've got over this side. Yes, we'll go far side. Hi. The left side. Yes. Yeah. Jim and I read Quadrant. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
I read the questions. Only because I like reading myself. Yeah, yeah. It's a little more interesting because um, the following Tuesday, Monday was a public holiday in WA. The following Tuesday, a scholarly friend of mine emailed me the online version of my article in the AFR. Mm. And I contacted the AFR and said, what, what's going on here? Someone had forgotten to delete it from their website. So this too hot to handle piece had actually been on the AFR website on Saturday, Sunday, Monday for anybody who wanted to read it. So either they don't have the circulation that they thought they had, might actually be more like quadrants, um, or else, um, you know, what would have happened though? I mean, if somebody had taken offence at that. I think Joseph has an answer for you. I think it's useful to remember, first of all, uh, a fundamental principle in the law of defamation, and that uh, defamation is the publication, uh, unlawful publication of matter that defames another. The key word there is unlawful. In other words, if you can provide a lawful excuse to damage another person's reputation, then go ahead and do it. Uh, because the whole raft of the defenses, uh, justification, truth, uh, fair comment, honest opinion, the qualified privilege defenses, implied freedom of political communication, and so on. Now, uh, the Taylor and Francis uh, Guide to Authors 2001 uh, has a very strange uh, piece of advice to prospective authors, which probably explains what happened in your case. If in doubt, leave it out. Which is a very strange uh, piece of advice to be giving to prospective authors, especially of academic works. But that's a cop-out. Uh, I would suggest that if one is in doubt, one should check it out and reinforce one's argument and uh, I'll stop there. Well said. We've got another one from this side, sir. Yes, uh, I just wanted to turn to uh, the shield law that uh, you were discussing earlier. Um, and it seems to me with the conflation of the, the public and private spheres of, of debate, um, if the shield laws uh, were extended uh, um, incrementally to to uh, spheres that we don't think of as being public at the moment. Um, I mean, the, the evidentiary effect that that would have on defamation proceedings, the, 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 the uh, uh, restrictions on, on the ability to gather yeah. evidence, is going to result in a lot of uh, unemployed defamation lawyers. I mean, as a retired lawyer myself, that doesn't particularly grieve me, but I'm more concerned about the young people here today who, um, you know, who are not going to make uh, yeah. prosperous careers as defamation lawyers. Yeah. I mean, the, the, obviously journalists are red hot on shield laws because it offers them protection. It's a, it's a very important issue to them. I think that there's a, there's a value to be served in shield laws. The difficulty is with defamation. And, of course, um, if you are defamed and you go to court uh, and um, the, um, the journalist uses truth as a defence, you may well want to um, know who the source is as to whether they are a truthful source. It was actually put to me by um, lawyers acting for organised media who said, oh, you don't need to have any exceptions there because um, if we run journalists, the newspaper, truth as a defence, we'll have to prove it were true. Um, and, you know, so we'll need witnesses to prove it were true. Uh, that may be so, but it, but it may be the case that you deliver witnesses to court to prove the truth of it without ever revealing your source. Uh, and nevertheless, I think a, a, a plaintiff would want to be able to get at the source and, and work out whether or not that source, well, first of all, if they existed, uh, and secondly, whether or not they were a truthful, reliable source. And, and in the legislation we drafted, there are basically exceptions for precisely that, that contingency. Right, yes. <laughs> the media's had a fair caning, but would the panel perhaps like to comment on issues of freedom of speech and abuse of parliamentary privilege? Nick? Yeah, look, I'll, I'll take that. Because, <laughs> <laughs> uh, because I've got a great deal of sympathy for it, so hence why I'm, I'm happy to take the question. Uh, it goes to the very heart of where I left my presentation that uh, parliaments have all these uh, powers that have been uh, articulated this afternoon to restrict the freedom of speech if they choose to do so. Uh, but what level of personal responsibility will the members of parliament take for very uh, significant freedoms that they have? And uh, that's why I uh, carefully used the words champion, advocate and demonstrate and uh, the final one is, I think, the most important. And uh, as I say, I think goes to the heart of what we've seen this past week, particularly in the federal parliament, 
uh, that uh, there have not been uh, overwhelmingly good examples uh, of people demonstrating uh, that privilege that they have in the chamber uh, to speak freely in a responsible and a, a considered fashion. And uh, you know, if this week you might say we let it go through to the keeper, uh, perhaps you can argue it's, it's not the be all and end all. Uh, tomorrow the sun will still come up, uh, but uh, maybe it's the, the thin end of thin head edge of the wedge too, and uh, if uh, MPs don't take that issue uh, personally uh, to account, uh, then I think that you'll see a continuing uh, denigration of the role of Parliament, and uh, in particular for those of you who have read uh, two, I think, useful opinion pieces in today's West Australian, by Ross Thomas and also uh, Paul Murray, uh, really they're going to that same issue to say, look, uh, yes, you've got freedom of speech, but look how you guys are using it. And you really haven't used it responsibly, and therefore you're denigrating the very profession that you represent. Mm. But parliamentary privilege is obviously a very important part of parliamentary life and free speech. Yeah. And just in the last four years, in state parliament at least, I'd say that it's used, relatively speaking, appropriately and cautiously. I mean, there are some members of parliament who seem to be constantly defaming and apologising, defaming and apologising, but, uh, you know, that, that happens under parliamentary privilege. But. Yes. One more in the back? Okay, one more at the back, sorry. Um, my question is just to, to Nick, and it's, it's on the idea of um, offence. Uh, in, in your presentation with regard to, those, to the kids' clothing that you showed, you, you mentioned that uh, it should be Parliament's role to sort of regulate that clothing because people find it offensive. Now, there is, there is an argument that if someone is so offended by those you know, items of clothing or, or you know, whether it be the, the pornography or, or whatnot, um, that you, know, you should shut the book, don't shop there, um, close the web browser, change the channel. Now, I, in my view, offence is a too easy standard through which to go about limiting free speech. Um, so I'd just like to hear your thoughts on, on, on my comments, and, and I'd just like to sort of finish my question by saying that um, you know, if you're going to use offence as the standard through which you decide to, to legislate and limit uh, free speech, it, it can cross the Therefore, your presentation was more on limiting free on, on how Parliament can limit free speech rather than how Parliament can protect free speech. So I'd just like to, to hear your comments on that. Yeah, no problem. I think the first thing to say is that uh, this afternoon, and uh, I'm pleased to see that uh, there's a recording, uh, you can be assured that I never said that uh, Parliament is well to regulate those things. Uh, what, I, what I argued is that we have protected freedom of speech in the example of the shield laws but is that the only thing that Parliament should do? Uh, perhaps Parliament should champion, advocate and demonstrate the responsible use of freedom of speech. So at no point this afternoon, and uh, so we're getting abundantly clear, did I say that uh, uh, Parliament had a role to regulate those things, uh, nor did I say that offence should be the standard in which we should uh, review these matters. What I said was there was a particular um, instance on the screen that I found personally offensive, other people in the room may have as well, uh, but I don't necessarily think that uh, offence is, is a standard because uh, it, the problem that you then have is how subjective that is. <laughs> and uh, so it, it really just raises the question, uh, what do we do with these things? And uh, ultimately, I suppose, um, I, I have got some sympathy for the AMA and call for inquiry and the sexualisation of children. I think that that would be useful. Someone needs to do some of the heavy lifting to work out what we can tangibly do in this area. I suspect, personally, that ultimately we'll come back down to uh, ethics, respect and responsibility at a personal level. So as a parent, uh, what is my ethical, respectful and responsible role uh, with regard to the clothing that I choose to buy for my children and then put upon them to wear, um, it, it ultimately comes down to the individual. It's really, really hard area for the parliament to do something in it. Well, um, it's not a matter of offence, it's a matter of harm. So there's considerable, and the si but there's considerable uh, scientific evidence that shows that, that these types of materials do detrimentally affect the development and, and well-being of children. So I think I, I wouldn't, definitely wouldn't catch yeah, it in terms of offence. And, and, and I totally, um, I totally so. agree with you. I mean, if you think of those pictures that I showed uh, today, and as I said, I've toned them down for this, this audience uh, out of my own personal sensitivity. 
Uh, but just imagine for a moment uh, that that was you as a child, as a toddler, with that, those, that, that particular material that your parent decided to, to put upon you, and you're going to um, put that in your family album and say, oh, look at me as a kid. It's incredibly unfair to the child uh, who has absolutely no say whatsoever. Um, but I think that's an issue, but how you address that issue, I think, as I say, ultimately it comes down to the individual responsibility of the parent. Right that's the same thing as we said with the innocence of Muslims. There's a harm. In this case, arguably a less severe harm than several, a multiple homicide, but we're still saying we want to restrict free speech based on harm. And we're still, it's still that same core issue that we had in Isn't there a difference between the inexorable and unintended, but nonetheless have a result of harm to the development of children, which is just not the agency of someone else intervening, which if you could avoid, you'd stop, and that you say something if somebody else who's an adult who has agency then decides that what they'll do in response to that is to blow up somebody. I, I think they're it's different a predictable, categories. A predictable result of an action. Well, what I'm suggesting is that's not the only issue. Very difficult issues. All I know is I looked through our family photographs and as a three-year-old I was consistently dressed in Liberal Party campaign t-shirts. So. <laughs> <laughs> definitely, definitely cruelty to children. Thank you all very much. We'll end that session and, and move on. Christian, we can't let you go without thanking you and giving you a, a small gift. Thank you very much. Oh, yes. and, and an additional gift in the good side. Thank you. Oh, very good. Huh? <laughs> Thank you very much, Christian. <laughs> short break scheduled and then our keynote speaker.